Hey now, welcome to the dirty side of the track, America's leading Formula One podcast. I'm Brian, that's Rob. Today was the Dutch GP, and boy was it crazy. Yeah, it didn't look like it was going to be for a while. It sort of looked like we'd had a bit of a damp squib, and it wasn't going to be the battle that we'd all hoped after practice and quali had made it seem like we were going to get a bit more of a three-way shootout, which still didn't kind of happen, but we'll get there. We'll get yeah. there when we come to come to the review and the <clears throat> potential controversy within. Um, <laughs> but you got your tinfoil hat ready for that I one? Have, I have. Oh, I've right. properly got my tinfoil hat ready for the conspiracy theories. But um, <laughs> before we get there, as always, uh, news and social, race review, fantasy update, and yet again, because we're in a triple header, we will get another preview because we don't have to wait a week without a race again. Another amazing track coming up next week. I'm so excited. This is a great triple header. So, but, but, after um, thoughts of greatness, then we have to go to thoughts of bitterness and, and, <laughs> and horrible tastes left in mouth. Because, oh, God, yes. Um, after the Piastri to McLaren thing got formally announced, okay, that's cool. Okay, it's all announced. Here he yeah, is. We knew that was going. We pretty much knew that. And was we knew that happen. was mostly. I mean, the, yeah. the big thing was the contract being upheld, right? Which it was McLaren's to had the legal position on the contract. So, okay, happy days. But then all the little details and the timeline starts oh. eking out, and McLaren have just gone down in my estimations, big style, because when they got Danny Rick uh, along to the McLaren tech center the mtr or whatever it's called uh to do that speech in front of the crew and do his all i'm here i love you i'll be here next year don't worry danny yeah, he went out on anywhere. social media did yeah. the same thing professed his love for mclaren i'm back next year it's my option but it was days after they'd already signed piastri i, know. I mean that's just so sneaky and underhand I just like why why you you know this is all going to come out eventually so why put danny rick well that? i mean maybe stinks. they didn't know the timeline would come out but man in my estimation you got to be straight up with people they should have gone at the very latest the next day to danny rick and said look you know, just so you know, you won't, you're not going to be driving for us next year and we'll work on a buyout here or whatever they want to do. But don't let the man go out in front of the team, in front of the world, on social media and proclaim his, uh, you know, affiliation for next year when you've already signed his replacement. Yeah. Signed him already. Oh, man. That stunk the house out that did. That was not, not a good look on, uh, not a good look on McLaren at all. Um, the silly season is uh, going to probably carry on rolling now because that's going to unlock some various bits and pieces. There's a, and in fact, just before we started recording this, I saw um, Nate Saunders from ESPN had tweeted out a story showing there's ga uh, momentum gathering on the whole Colton Herter coming across from the US uh, to Alpha Tauri. So Which also means there's very serious smoke and momentum about Pierre leaving. So yeah. that I did, I mean, like even that. I mean, we have to give it up, right? Can we just say something really fast for Marcus Erickson and his August 1st tweet where he had <laughs> almost all of this perfect? And it made no sense then. No sense. And I retweeted it because I, I liked it and I remembered it. I was like my first day of vacation and Marcus Erickson sends out this tweet which made no sense about people going here and there. And it's all coming true. He's the Nostradamus <laughs> of silly season for 2022, <laughs> Marcus Erickson. Yeah, he really is. Um what else has happened this week? Oh, yeah, so um, we dropped a blog um, after last week's just masterclass by Max. We decided to take a look at kind of the machinery that he's driving, and that led me down a rabbit hole of looking at a bit of the career of Adrian Newey, and um, it, it's just so interesting. We wrote the quick blog on it. I think it probably warrants a veil's tales of a non-driver at some point because... I think um, you're right. Yeah, guy's a genius. Um, and it was as I was digging into it, I never realized how much he'd been involved in ground effect back in the day in the 80s. Um, so, you know, he kind of already predicted this porpoising stuff was going to be an issue. <laughs> he just so, dusted off his old notebooks. He's like, oh, we're ready. We yeah, got this. Yeah, and, and, you, and as we kind of hinted in the blog, it's kind of like, well... We'll, we'll never know, I guess, the full details, but does that enable, it must enable Red Bull to come to the table with a car they're a lot more confident is going to be good in the new regs, and then they spend all of their early season development polishing as opposed to panic mode recovery from this porpoising issue and various other things that we've seen people do. So, yeah, I don't know. What do you think on that, Brian? Conspiracy theory number one. That's not conspiracy Pe theory. No, That's just mine, a mine. Genius. Hold on, mine. Okay. People have been saying that Red Bull are using Alpha Tauri money to continue development this season. 
and that they're basically laundering money through Alpha Tauri. We'll talk more about conspiracies <laughs> later. There was seriously, there was I a tweet, in all, in all joke, there was a tweet earlier this week, and I saved it, and I was going to bring it here, and then I looked down, I'm like, nah, this is too tinfoil hat, and I deleted it, and I talked about Helmut Marco and his undue influence on the FIA and a Formula One, and the whole relationship between Red Bull and Alpha Tauri and all these rumors about Red Bull's development money and their driver pipeline behind Max and how they build the cars for Max and only Max and yada yada yada. And but then, even if they do, why why shouldn't they? But then but then today happened and like this whole like laundering. Oh no, we'll the get money to we'll get to that yeah, other yeah. bit later today. But I you know I kind of like. Oh no, I'm good with looking, developing. No no the cars no, I know Max. I'm with you yeah, on this, but yeah. I was looking at this all this stuff where people go, oh yeah yeah no, they single out Max for success. Okay, what's actually wrong with that? Yeah, they know who the number one driver is. Yeah, if they know who the number one driver is, and Perez's job will be to get points to help in the constructors, help out Max where possible, and if Max drops it for whatever reason, then hopefully come through and maybe take a win of his own. But Max is the number one. Uh, If Ferrari had actually worked this out at the beginning, and not, and because they didn't, they wouldn't prioritize uh, Charles over Sainz right at the beginning. If they had, and they'd made a clear direction, maybe they'd be. I don't get this whole criticism of uh, Red Bull because they decided. And today, Mercedes also didn't make a choice. They clearly did not make Hamilton the first priority. They left him out there to dry. We'll talk more uh, we'll, about we'll that. We'll get that later. Don't yeah. mind. They did. They did. Keep your powder dry. Keep ah. your powder dry. We're still in news and social now. Now, this one makes me laugh, right? I saw this headline on Twitter. Somebody said, this is the best click bait ever. When you read the story, <laughs> it's technically true. There is nothing lying in this headline. And the headline is, Max joins McLaren. And I was like, what? And I saw this thing, best clickbait ever. I'm like, oh no, I'm going to have to fall for it now because I'm going to have to click it to see what the, you know, I'm going to become part of the clickbait. And you click it and it was a story about the fact that by winning that uh, race last week and coming from so far back, uh, he now joins Bruce, Bruce, McLaren, Bruce McLaren on yeah, being the, uh, the second person to win consecutive races from below 10th on the grid. So absolutely 100% an accurate headline. <laughs> and then we, we'd even said that on the pod. That was one of our oh, stats. Yeah, we're, but yeah. we're ahead of our time. Yeah. Um, also, something we're thinking about implementing here at the Dirty Side is a bit of a how do we appreciate each, each country geographic area for something special. And so on our Discord, shout out to everybody on the Discord, and if you're not there, join us. Um, we were talking about sampling beers from each country before the race. And we kind of came up with this at the last minute, so I quickly ran out, and I'm currently drinking a Grolsch which was the only Dutch beer I could find in my in my selection here other than Heineken. So I took a Grolsch. I haven't had a Grolsch in a couple of years. Um, very good. I'm enjoying it right now as we're recording this midday. Now, I haven't eaten any food today, so who knows? I know it's just one <laughs> beer. I'll be fine. But if this was like the second or third, it'd be a problem. But t- what did you used to do, Rob, when you were a kid with the, the Grolsch tops? Uh, when I was younger, the, the, the craze was to the Grolsch bottle, for anyone who's not seen the Grolsch bottle top, is the cap that holds it in place pops off and is held by like a, an elaborate metal... I'm going to call it device, ring, whatever you want to call it. But you can actually pop that off the bottleneck. And uh, people used to put that on their trainers or sneakers, as people will say over here, and uh, look really, really cool, apparently. <laughs> if you did it, it must have been. <laughs> uh, I'm enjoying the Grolsch. So that is, we're going to keep that up. And obviously with Monza next week, we'll find some beautiful Italian beers to try. Um, a couple, three actually, uh, videos uh, of note to check. McLaren had a paint challenge with uh, Danny Rick and Lando painting. They had to mix papaya colored paint and then paint this little device, little thing here. It was very meh. But the highlight for me was the company who did the paint with them was Axo Nobel, who's a partner of theirs, who I'd never heard of until I took a job 10 years ago and they had an office in our building. I'm like, what the hell is Axo Nobel? And it's a paint company. So there you go. Well, um, I mean, that just goes to show how bad that video was, if that's the It was that video. bad. That's all I took for it. Like, Lando <laughs> made one off-color joke, and that was about the funniest part. Um, Red Bull had Max at a simulator running Zandvoort. Again, not that great. But one of my favorite ones, and this is an old one, but it may be fun for some folks to watch. It was an old piece of gold. It was from a channel called Lando Norris Plays from March 23rd, 2020. So like 10 days into the pandemic. And he was streaming, and he's on there. He's, he has Discord running on one side. He's streaming on Twitch, and he's calling people for tips about the race that's coming up. He calls Carlos. He calls Max. He calls George. He calls uh, Zach Brown. 
He calls some race engineers, and they're all on speaker, and he doesn't tell any of them they're on the thing. And it is great, man. So, like, I was laughing my butt off. I recognize it's two years old. But uh, it was just funny to watch, you know, people pick up the phone all over the globe and give him tips on racing and then just making fun of him and him making fun of them. And then he'd call the next person. So kind of enjoy the behind the scenes aspects of that kind of stuff. So a good news or funny story surrounding Lando and uh, messages on phones. Yes, yes, as opposed let's, to... Let's, yeah, let's not yeah. go there. Do you want to go to McDonald's? Isn't that what he, <laughs> what he proposed as well, I think? Apparently, he's a, he's a real up-end, uh, high-class guy, right? Yeah. So I'll, I'll buy you a uh, chicken McNugget meal, if you're lucky. <laughs> Maybe a milkshake. Just don't tell my girlfriend. Yeah, <laughs> right, okay, <clears throat> moving on. Uh, so that was that's, uh, kind of news and social. Um, so then we got to race week. Um practice let's kind of like wrap practice all up in one big bow right so practice kind of what we talk about practice man sorry i had to just (laughs) there was only really one thing that i took from it and it was max's gearbox but i'll let you go yeah, well, it was like, so Max uh, got red flagged uh, the FP1, and I thought, oh, okay, maybe this is going to be a bad weekend for him, and we'll get some uh, different people fighting for, for the lead. And uh, FP2 and FP3 kind of backed that up, that we were starting to see some pace coming around, and especially from Mercedes, and it's like, oh, okay. And people didn't seem to be sandbagging because there was decent pace going on as well. So it got me really kind of like super psyched. The only thing I was kind of looking at, though, was... Um, Alfa Romeo, uh, they just seem in a downward cycle at the moment. Um, we were, I can't remember if it was on Discord or whatever, Brian, earlier this week, me and you were going back and forth on something. You kind of lumped Haas into the same bucket as uh, Alfa Romeo, saying that, you know, they're, they're just not they're going backwards. They're not doing what they should be doing. I was kind of looking at it and thinking, it doesn't feel right. So I did, some, I did my Inspector Seb, and I went investigating. And... Alpha Romeo started off really well. Valtteri oh, was I in know. the top 10 consistently, 5th, 6th, 7th, consistently in those early days. Now, Haas were just kind of flying along in that kind of upper midfield and popping in and grabbing points every now and again. And that's kind of what they've kept on doing. So, yeah. Haas have just kind of been much less bad than they were last year. Correct. And every now and again, pop up and grab points. Whereas you look at Alpha, and it's a downward yeah, trend. They have tanked since just before the mid-season break. They've gone from threatening for po not may yeah, maybe threatening for podiums but at least right. that kind of upper end of the points to just seem to be nowhere near even dreaming of points at the moment i don't know what is going on there it feels like both somehow reliability's gotten worse there been, it feels like there've been more dnfs at alfa romeo the second half of the season so far as opposed to the the front half and when they do finish today Zhou guan Yu finished 16 and so i i would still say well i agree with you that it feels like Alfa Romeo's trajectory is more of a decline than Haas. I would say Haas was also threatening, you know, the lower... I remember Magnussen running fifth in a lot of races. Mick has gotten better. They finished 13th and 15th today. And this is a common thing. I don't remember the last time they had, like... Mick had points a couple races ago, and that was it for a yeah, while. that's what I mean. So they, they, they carry on hovering... I know. At that I'm saying it's not as the deep... The, the slope of the line is not quite the same as it's, the... It's not elf. even a slope. Take a look at the Haas results. It's not even a slope. Oh, it's a it's almost a flat line wrong. with the occasional grab up to points and then yeah, back to the flat line again. No. Whereas Alpha is... I feel as though Haas is Alpha Junior at this point. I'll do, mm-hmm. I'll do some research as well. Do How about research, that? research and the stats yeah. won't lie, I'm telling you. No, stats never lie. Anywho... Uh, that kind of led us on into quality thinking it wasn't going to be a great um, day for probably uh, Haas, uh, Alpha, Williams. They were all kind of, and Alpha, Romeo. So Alpha, Tauri, Alpha, Romeo, Williams, and Haas were all kind of looking like they were going to struggle. Um, so quality comes along, and the first thing that we're saying uh, as we're exchanging texts is just our, our love for the banked corners. Oh, God, especially turn three. That was the one I referenced last week. I mean, there were a lot of great bank corners, but turn three, that quick, tight, you know, inside left-hander that cars try to go too wide, even a little more, on this banking, and it's, oh, that is so cool. That is like the, I I love that corner. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and then um, Lando managed to go, and it looked like both, we were going to lose both uh, McLarens. Danny Rick is just kind of pootling along, thinking, well, I'm not here next year, so why bother? <laughs> um, and uh, it looked like, well, he wasn't really underperforming because Norris wasn't really setting the world on fire either. Then all of a sudden he goes and dropped it into, I didn't write it down, but kind of like well up uh, yeah. to get through into Q2 easily. And we lost uh, Latifi, Vettel, Danny Rick, K-Mag, and 
bought us. Yeah, which starts a new streak. Uh, the number we m- read last week, I believe, was 148 races where he had not, where he had advanced past Q1, and so it was the first time last week where he hadn't. Well, now two in a row. Two in a row. Yeah, uh, he has not made it to Q2, which is very unvaltery like. And then we get into Q2, and um, we have idiots, both throwing flares and and birds. The birds are the idiots in this case. The pigeons. Um, oh, the, well, hang on. Well, I'm going to take. I'm going to take a stand. You enjoyed the, the pigeons. pigeons here, you right? loved the pigeons. I thought the the flares on the track 100 percent idiots. Yeah, well, why? Why throw flares on the track? You just uh, don't yeah. throw anything on the track. Just, just, uh, just yeah. dangerous enough. You don't need foreign objects floating around an F1 track. But the pigeons. <laughs> pigeons are either they are either dumb or they just have nerves of steel because they are essentially <laughs> becoming like the apex markers on some exactly. of those corners. Ba- <laughs> like, battery Voltos uh, or someone said you know, the new track limit sensors. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, joking aside, you obviously wouldn't want to see a Formula One car hit a pigeon at uh, high speed, but they just seem to keep pushing the limits of, um, I don't care, I don't care, I don't care, and then they fly away at the very last second. It's like, whew. Yeah. Okay. At least and a Lance, pigeon can fly away. Uh, you know, yeah. a, a flare is a flare. It's just going to sit there, isn't it? So. Right. And forgetting the, again, forgetting the smoke it gives off, it's still not something you want on the track. Um Lance, man, Lance put in a massive lap. Kudos to Lance and Aston Martin. Their setup apparently fits this track, just like Williams had a good one at Spa. Apparently, Aston Martin would love to keep racing at Zandvoort. Um, He popped in a great time. And, you know, it was fascinating. We lost Albon, Zhou Guan Yu, uh, Fernando, Esteban, and Pierre. And I think it was Fernando, right, where he came back and said he had traffic in his way. And the announcers kind of dismissed it. And they showed Checo in turn eight. I actually felt Checo was in his way. It was near the apex of where he was trying to go. How close can you get to traffic you're trying to pass? I thought it was, quite honestly, I thought it, he was in his way. I'd agree with with uh, Fernando on that one. But then we moved to Q3. Well, we, we do. And, and out of the names that you've uh, listed there, we haven't lost Mick. A yeah, big shout out to Mick there, making it through to, uh, Amazing. Making it through to Q3. Um, I was surprised to see Max go out. Just like the commentators were saying, he was like one of the first cars out on track in Q3. And especially as this thing was kind of um, seeming to be getting faster as more rubber was going down. I, I honestly thought maybe that was a sign of he needed to get a banker in because he was fearful of the pace that the... Especially, actually, Mercedes was showing the pace. So did he just want to go and get a banker out there so that he could do a full-on... Knowing he was going to probably need to do a full-on second attack lap. Um, but he dropped a stonker in on his first one. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's in another world. He yeah. is that good. And it's not just the car. I'm so tired of people saying Lewis won his championships because of the car, and Max is good now because of the car. He's that good. It's, it's, it's the blend, isn't it? It's well, I mean, you can't win from the back. If you, you put Max in a Williams, he's not going to win. Exactly. You but can't have you could, you could put Latifi put a, in a Red Bull, he ain't gonna win either. Exactly. That's just what I was gonna say. You know, it's 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 when every now and again you get the combination of the best driver and the best machine. So yeah. Lewis it was unbeatable in that Mercedes for a while, and I just think Max and this Red Bull is again on a on a different level. However, it didn't look like it was gonna be all his own way because after that second run then Charles comes around with an absolute phenomenal lap and gets provisional pole. Um but then Max decides to go like a slit. I don't even know how how you could measure it. I mean, it's like it's not even a blink of an eye, is it? It's probably it's probably less than that. But Max takes it. But then it starts getting spicy, and it looks like the Mercedes are on like superb laps. And it's oh my god, oh my god, is Lewis going to get pole? Is going to get Lewis going to get pole? Uh, Team Radio, Checo, if you could just bin it now. Be- <laughs> oh, this is our second. <laughs> this is second foil number one. <laughs> theory. No, I already gave you the laundry money through. Oh, sorry. Yes, yeah, sorry. Number two. So, um, yeah, so then we had Max, Charles, Carlos, Lewis, Checo, George, and then Lando, Mick, uh, Yuki, and Stroll rounding out the 10 to get started on the grid. But a couple stats, and I'm going to use this uh, old school kind of, uh, I like this one. Sap stats, yeah. So... The question that I found interesting is after qualifying, there was some analysis done of who hit the highest top speeds. And Red Bull, Alpha Tauri had the two highest top speeds, followed by Alpine, uh, which is not a surprise. We've seen them being real slippery. Uh, Haas, Alfa Romeo, Williams. Williams, by the way, because again, they're slippery. And then the cars with higher downforce, 
or maybe less good aero. Ferrari, Mercedes, McLaren, Aston, all tied for the lowest top speed, highest, the lowest, highest top speeds, if that worked at all <laughs> remotely. Where, where's this sap stat going? What's the stat no, for? Hold on. Okay, and so okay. then the question was asked, how much time do the cars spend at maximum throttle? So how, to, in order to put the power down, how much time can they spend at max throttle with the highest speeds and so forth? Mercedes is actually near the front. They were the first, 57.3% of the time in quality, they were at max throttle. Ferrari also did a good job. So the two of the lowest top speeds are good at getting the, the power down, at least. What I found interesting, because I was going to say, oh man, Mercedes, McLaren, Aston, all to back, those are Mercedes power units. We have a Mercedes power unit problem. And then I start looking at it, I go, it's a combo. Because the car that put the lowest amount of power down... Uh, was a Williams who was near the back, but then McLaren is second to last, and they had the lowest top speed. So to me, here's the stat. <laughs> I'm Ready? Like, I can't work out. Wait, I'm just having flashbacks to the quiz. So no, just this is good. <laughs> I'm going to save it. So the team with the lowest top speed and the second least amount of time on full throttle is McLaren. And so Danny Rick, we know, is struggling a bit. You can kind of see where some of that pace comes from. But Lando, putting it where he did, I think shows enormous potential from from that guy we've always loved him he was great last year if they get the car around him i think lando's going to be a real serious challenger because he's driving what appears to be a slot bucket uh given those two statistics all top speed hasn't really got much impact on this circuit it's a it's a, when, it's a motor race going fast is important yeah i know but when you just when you put this stat up, i was trying to work out where's he going to go with this one when i could see it in the notes and obviously i wasn't inside your brain to understand why you've put it there and i'm like so you're saying it's a Mercedes power problem, yet here we are just talking about how Lewis is probably going to get pole if it hadn't been for Checo binning but it. He, and Russell they were was able to put the well, power so. down more than any other car because of the way they use downforce and their aero works. So it's a combo of two things. Uh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, we should get Dr. Obbs on here. He knows exactly I'm right. Well, I just don't think speed had got that much influence around this track because your own stats kind of a race car. Back. Yeah, but look, Red Bull, like you said, the fastest by a long way. Mercedes, the slowest, the joint slowest. Yet Mercedes were going to take pole if it hadn't been for the spin. But they put power down more than Red Bull. They were at max pace more because they could handle full throttle more often around but the corners. But that max pace still wasn't as fast as Red Bull's because they're faster. Uh, go. You're only talking about wasn't straight really line. I'm talking about corners too. <laughs> I just got one of these feelings. It's one of these random thoughts that came into your head, so you decided oh, no. to make an entire feature out of it. <laughs> it was good, and our listeners know. <laughs> so then the race happens. Moving on. <laughs> um, man, what? Uh, so the <laughs> when the race started today, Max really went hard on that. I'm going to cut oh you off. God. I yeah. thought he was going to like lose traction. He was going to the right so fast. I thought he wasn't going to stop going, and he was just going to like disappear <laughs> off the side of the TV. Like, like steering wheel was move, broken. And, like, well, they say you're allowed to make one move across the tra racetrack, and I would definitely categorize that as one move. I mean, it was a big one, yeah. but it worked. I mean, yeah. nothing wrong with it. He didn't do anything wrong. Charles but, wow, went in just... behind him thinking, all right, I'll take the outside line. Yeah, I know. But, um, um, yeah, Norris jumped George. Lewis, uh, I think, poked his nose in, uh, in on Carlos. I think that was on Lewis for getting a little frisky up the inside on, on Carlos. And then you loved it when K-Mag decided to go off the track. <laughs> Brush the we've wall seen this a couple going. of times, right? And, yeah. and I, I don't, I'm not technically gifted enough to understand what the problem is, but we've seen it a few times this year. I think it might have happened to Science when he went off, where a car's mid-corner, and a suddenly just the back end just twitches. It, it doesn't look like much. It just twitches enough, and then suddenly it's like the car just then disappears off track to the side. It's like the, the driver <laughs> is like a passenger all of a sudden because it doesn't look like a big loss. But you saw it. K Mag came around the corner, back end twitches ever so slightly, and suddenly he's got no ability to make the corner anymore. Yeah. So he, he has goes to steer. You have to steer into it, basically, or else you're going to lose the rear end. And unfortunately, he had to steer into it so much that he went right off the track. He walked it right off. But there was no other choice, I don't think. No. You steer no, he, right, and that thing's uh, spinning around. Exactly, yeah. So he went across. And I actually thought he was going to be out. It looked like he, um, in real time, it looked like he had more impact with that wall yeah. than when you saw it in replay. It was, I thought the gearbox sort of... might be hosed or the rear suspension or something. Yeah, and then um, i gotta, I got to uh, take you up on a note because uh, he was not in DRS as you typed it. I'm reading your notes now. So you said about your, your good old uh, um, DRS train. DRS train falling behind Mick. And it wasn't behind Mick. It and was when I typed said it. And even the commentators at the time no. you were typing it called it a Yuki train. <laughs> Correct, because he'd fallen behind. Yuki was too slow to keep up with Mick, and he lost the second. 
It but was within it was, a second was, when I typed it. Do you need me you, to show I, the rerun? No, I'm, I'll be with you on this one. But it, it was very early, I thought. Normally, the DRS train thing right. is kind of Lap like Lap seven. Yeah. And so let's say Mick did power off, and it but it was Yuki, Pierre, Fernando, Joe, and uh, it was just crazy. It was And it was early, and it just kept going. It was. And um, it was... It was funny how um, that banked corner, um, everyone had the same line all the way through. And they'd made some reference about there might be a different line through that corner that might be faster. You you don't need to go up high. And Alonso was coming in. He was getting feisty on someone. I can't remember who he was going for. And he decided to take the low road through the corner. I was like, ooh, okay. Here's a masterclass (laughs) from Alonso. And basically went backwards and almost lost the position to the car behind. And no one ever tried that low road again. (laughs) Well, Checo got stuck there later when he was trying to make the move on Lewis. We'll talk about it in a minute. Because Seb came out and got in the way and was like going five. But uh, like his number, but uh, yeah, that was, I, and at this point early, we started seeing um, both early pit stops. I think Seb was the first-ish around lap 12, but this is where it got really exciting. And I put a little tweet out about Ferrari being confused because A, cars started pitting early. And then B, you started realizing there's definitely going to be a uh, two or possibly one stop difference between the strategies. And so at this point, it's early, but I'm like, oh, this could be good. Yeah, and it was, it all got thrown a little bit upside down, and we'll probably come on to it because tires being your favorite subject, we won't, and because of what happened today, we won't be able to get away from talking about them. But it all went into some weird reversal land where softs didn't seem to be the fastest, and mediums are starting to uh, be the tire of choice. And Hamilton was catching signs, even though signs was on soft and allegedly a better car, and Hamilton's right. on the mediums. And then Alonso comes in and <laughs> puts hards on, and, and we you... both are like, "What in the world?" Because everyone <laughs> um, in the world is saying, "Don't go to hards." Don't go to hards. This is the ridiculous track for hards. And on the Discord server, people had gone. Uh, we were discussing um, tire strategies before the race, and all the guys. On there are kind of going, is it going to be a medium, medium, soft, a soft, medium, soft? One thing for sure, no one's going to run the hards out here. Well, and the commentators are like, we don't anticipate seeing any hard tires. Lap 13, it was <laughs> when Fernando came in and goes onto the hards, and everyone's like, what? Yeah. And at this point, Ferrari was very confused, I'm sure. The Ferrari strategists were like, uh, you know, why are they going on hards? If they probably just did it, I was just wondering if they'd just done it to troll Ferrari. Like, Alonso wasn't really interested in any points. <laughs> he just wanted to see if he could uh, troll Ferrari on it. But, um, and, and Mick was slowly but surely kind of hanging into his 10th spot. He'd lost, well, sorry, he'd started 8th and lost a couple of spots, but he was, he'd started on medium and everyone else around him was on soft. And I thought, this is looking good. You know, he does a good stint, gets the mediums out of the way. It'll come back to him. Oh, this kid gets no luck. He comes in and has something well, like an eight, lo- loses eight seconds in the in well, the pit window. Gets but, no luck. It, he, then he gets topped one lap later. Yeah, and then not to be outdone by a slow pit stop. So Mick comes in and has a very poor pit stop. And Ferrari strategists say, "Hold my beer, <laughs> hold my beer." Yeah, he's like, "Hold my Grolsch," which is really good. I'm almost done with it. I'm really enjoying it here. Um, oh. Yeah, that was terrible. Did they not know there were four tires on a car? I hadn't seen it, or maybe they didn't show it in real time. Um, the, the, the guy just stood there looking for his tire. Go, like, left he was rear, like, looking left around. rear is just looking around. He's got his, first of all, he's got his jack hanging out in the pit lane, his extra jack, or his extra wheel gun. Second, he's just standing there waiting for a tire. Nonchalant. No one's waving their arms or anything. They're like, where's the left rear? I don't know. And then someone comes it? out with a tire eventually, and they fit it, and he takes off. And I'm like, oh, oh no, we're back. I, I'm sure we'll we'll have to get pit lane Paul to give us an insight onto this, but like, is he supposed to wave? It, it did look like he was kind of sat there thinking, "I know I'm supposed to be doing something right now, but normally <laughs> I would be given something." It feels and, like, and he's kind of just like looking yeah. around, thinking. I was waiting for him to take his phone out and check Twitter. He's <laughs> waiting for his tire to arrive to fit it. I mean, and then like I said, Checo drove over the gun. No fault on Checo. It's a tight pit lane there. He had to go hard left to only run over it with his tires, as opposed to his car. Um, and then. And then Lando goes on the hards a couple laps later. I'm like, man, we were misled on the hard tires here. We were, because, I mean, Lando comes in, I think, on the data they've seen on Alonso, because Alonso is not exactly going backwards. I think he's actually catching people in front of him on this hard tire that's supposed to be the worst choice uh, for the weekend. And you kind of start seeing a few cars doing it. And the commentary team around lap 21 mentioned that, you know, Ferrari are monitoring the hards. There was a radio call (laughs) or some chapter about it. And it's like, well... If you're going to go to the hards, you probably should have done it because you're going to see how long they can last, right? You don't want to be... The, the later you leave it to jump to the hards, I, I thought, anyway, what did I know? Because um, 
well, we'll talk about it later as we get later on to the race, like the hards was just becoming the tire of choice uh, yeah. the longer this thing went on. And had there been no issues with VSCs or safety cars, it would have been really fascinating to see how these strategies played out. Because again, you take less time in the pits changing tires, one versus two stops, but your tires burn out eventually and can people catch you on fresher ones? So we never, we'll never know. Um, but uh, it was interesting because at this point, Mercedes realized we're doing a one-stopper. And whether they'd planned it or whether the data proved it out uh, with Fernando's hards, I don't know. Uh, you saw Max taking George, took a little while behind him, but, but took him out. And then on lap 30, Lewis pits for hard tires. And so it's set, right? We are now on a Max is on a two stop. Lewis is on a one stop. This is what's going to happen. And it's looking spicy for the end of the race. And I'm really getting excited to see what would have happened. Yeah. Cause it's getting into that whole window now where you're, you can't, it's one of those races where you can't really um, trust your eyes in terms of what you're seeing in terms of track position because of that whole extra layer of who's got to stop again what are they going to go for how are they going to eke this out uh, and it was really looking like it was going to uh, kind of really, like you say spicy we're going to get spicy towards yeah. it well, the, the, but the one team that we're not really mentioning here other than the, uh, the bad pit stop was Ferrari just didn't seem to be part of it at all because well, they, 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 they don't react but to they're what up happens front. They, in theory they're up front and they should be doing something to kind of the same way that mercedes were changing their plans or maybe they didn't maybe like you say maybe they were always going to go to hards but it just felt like this was turning into a mercedes versus red bull despite the fact charles was still up there i mean he was still running like high he just didn't seem to be going anywhere he wasn't catching anybody yeah but at this point they realized plan c won't work <laughs> hey charles plan c not going to work question and I'm like, what are we doing? We're back to the left. It was only C, though. I mean, McLaren went to G last week. So, uh, yeah. I mean, just it was a mess. Mick was on hards at this point. It was going to be interesting to see where everybody went. And then on lap 36, Lewis came in and comes out, uh, or comes around the corner, sorry, of the pits. He's got Checo. They're battling. And Seb comes out of the pit stop and gets right Parks his car right in front of Lewis after Lewis had just passed Checo like ten seconds earlier. And that was I'm a great literally, pass as well. That it was, was a great, great pass. pass. I'm I'm watching this. I'm like, no, Seb, no. And then he's going significantly slower than either Lewis or Checo. And I'm like, Checo is going to get Lewis here and take his spot back. And then they get to turn three. And now Lewis is right up Seb's trumpet on the outside line. Checo's on the inside trying to take him. And as you said, it's too there's too much sand. It's just not wasn't able to to hold it. But he ripped his tires apart, apparently fighting Lewis, because later on Checo just faded. Well, uh, yeah. At that I mean, point. That was a shocker to me. Like that's have, Checo's move is managing his tires. Well, A, the ease at which Lewis hunted down Checo, and Lewis is on the hards at this point. The the tire that no one's going to be on, if everyone remembers, um, the 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 awful tire, <laughs> right? Uh, which everyone's and going Hamilton to just breezes past him on a really good move. Um, yes, Seb gets in the way. It looks like Checo's going to go for it, but very quickly, Lewis just drops him, and it stops becoming a can Checo kind of get back on pace and catch uh, Lewis. Now George is hunting him down, but. I think Lewis battled with Checo for a couple of laps. He had a couple of goes at him around corners, had to back out a couple of times. George just went like him, passed him like he wasn't there. <laughs> exactly. He, I mean, was... it was a. Gr- he came out of the last corner and was on full throttle. DRS just rolled right past him. I uh, had the move done by the corner, and it was around this time I got a couple texts that I thought were interesting. One, and I actually thought the same thing. Someone texted me. I thought Nick DeVries was Toto's thirteen-year-old son the first time I saw him. It was hilarious. Nick Nick was attached to Toto's elbow the whole time in in the garage. But on Quali Day, they both had a black sweater tied around their neck like they were going to Bunny Skyler's brunch <laughs> afterwards. And they're both but they both did it. I'm like, "Bro, you can't you there's easier ways to get a job than trying to dress like your boss. I mean, you can't please don't do that." And then I got another text. This race is a tire nerd's dream. Uh and I said, "Thank you to Mark." The first one was from David. The second one was from Mark. Yeah, those were spot on. And, and, um, and but yeah. keeping the tire theme going, it was it, obviously it was that uh, Checo had um, ruined his tires in that in that battle with the Mercedes because then when he came into pit and, he, and um, Red Bull dropped him out right in front of Alonso. Alonso, right to use your front. phrase, came right up his trumpet. Yeah, and I well, thought that's a Alonso's expression. That's uh, a, a Alonso's going to have him here. He's going to absolutely have him for breakfast. But fresh tires. Um, once he kind of got his bearings, Checker then kind of dropped Alonso and we didn't see a battle um, there that I was really looking forward to. I thought Alonso getting feisty in an Alpine trying to throw it up the inside of a yeah. Red Bull would be pretty cool, but pretty it was cool. obvious the pace was just wasn't there in the Alpine today. 
And then uh, Checo did get the fastest lap on those new tires, but then basically, uh, signs pitted, but whatever. Then, then, then the event happened. Uh, well, the we big to, race is this conspiracy changer. point three now. Yeah, it's you, I'll let you do this because you're you're definitely more tinfoil than I am on this one. No, I'm not saying I I believe it. I'm just it, it would just you you only had to go and glance at Twitter for half a second to see just like a million theories kind of all come out. So Yuki is pulling over to the side and saying, my wheel is loose, my wheel is loose, and basically parks his car at the side of the road. And we think, okay, is this going to be a VSC? Is it going to be a safety car? Where's he parked it? Um, team come on and say, wheels are fine. <laughs> and he carries on driving again, rejoins, but drives really slowly and brings it back around. Now, Which we don't know why yet, but we'll learn in a second. But I've got to find out. I'm going to have maybe another question for Paul is... In the past, we've seen cars unreleased, and for whatever reason, they haven't put the wheel nut on properly, and a lap later, you've either got the uh, wobbly wheel, or it actually comes off altogether. Yeah, Haas did it twice held. in Australia years ago. Yeah, exactly, right? So, and the pit crew seem unaware of it. Nobody on the wall re- uh, radios the car and says, your wheels are loose, you've got to stop, right? They don't seem to have sensors that tell them that the wheels are tightened up. So, Yuki is reporting, my wheel is loose, I need to stop. They come on the radio and say, no, it's fine, just bring it back. So... But they know it's not loose, or well, I, I, I think now, and I don't know when. It's a great Paul question, and we did learn this from him. You know, they have the green light on the gun, and so when the when it goes green, it means the right. I think torque is there, and it's on. It should be on, unless something weird has happened. But so they have a green light on the gun. I'm done. My job is complete, and so I don't know if that's always been there. But, but that's only at the time of the pit stop. So if you've correct. left the pits and then like Yuki's reporting, oh, yeah. my wheel is loose. But why would I don't know what data the, they've got. I don't they've know what the data the they've pit. got to override yeah. that. That's and a good, say, point. good question. That's anyway, so that's part question. A. So it's all yeah. good now. Okay, there's no there's no safety car. There's no VSE because Yuki's going to bring it back round again. But he brings it back slowly and we're all wondering why. Yeah, and he rolls into the pits and they, they change, change the tires because that seems to be the problem. And then they go fidgeting around uh, in the cockpit <laughs> for like 30 seconds because it seems that he must have... When he was parking it because of what he thought was a wobbly wheel, he thought his race was done. So what they're saying is he'd already started to undo his seatbelt. Right. So that's why he was driving back so slowly because he wasn't really fitted in properly. Which, so by the way, have... that should be thought of as a penalty because I used to watch the old driver briefings. And when Charlie Whiting would do this, after races, Lewis would loosen his belts and wave. And other drivers would complain about Lewis loosening his belts on track after the race. And he would say that's completely not allowed. He's like, you cannot do that. And... After the race, it's a different story. This was during the race. Yeah. He's driving back with the, no belts on, basically. Yeah. And so they rummage around down there, and they uh, clip him all back in again. They put the wheels on, and they say <laughs> everything's fine, and they send him back out again. <laughs> and literally within half a lap, he's like, no. In fact, I didn't even hear what he said. Did he? I don't think he, he said anything. I think they said stop, stop, stop. Stop, stop, stop. So... I don't know what they've seen this time that they didn't see last time when they told him everything was fine. So now he parks it and we get the safety car. Well, we get the VSC, sorry. We get the VSC. Um, we get the VSC. And it's like all of this is happening. And this is where the tinfoil brigade comes in. So hold your horses here. This has come at a critical, critical point in the race where Max is has got track position. However, it's clear that Mercedes don't need to stop again, and he does. And it's obvious from the time differential that Max is going to drop definitely behind Lewis, probably behind George as well, right. and is now therefore going to have to pass both of them in order to win the race. So we're kind of really getting, looking forward to a grandstand finish here, and can Max pass both of them uh, to be able to go on and claim victory? Then this VSC happens, and now Max is able to take a much shorter pit stop uh, window and re- get brand new shiny tires and retain track position, and all hope of that brilliant showdown is gone. And the Tin Foil Brigade are basically saying, because of which team it was, Alpha Tauri, according to Brian's conspiracy theory number one, the money laundering epicenter of Red Bull, yes. there has been a phone call go through to uh, Alpha to... Uh, we need a VSC. It's and... not a phone call. It's it's. Do you ever watch a baseball? It's like when they give the signals. What happened was Helmet Marco went out into the pit lane and he rubbed his hand across his chest like steel <laughs> second, and he France tossed saw it at Alpha Tauri and he's like, oh, 
then they doffed his cap, and then they pulled the pl- pulled the plug. Yeah, on, and on then Yuki's everybody race. on Twitter's kind of going, and they screwed up on the first attempt to stop because where he <laughs> pulled it over the first time, it wouldn't have been right for VSC. That was so my like, favorite part. Bring it in again. Let's do a fake rummage to make it seem like the uh, his um, his uh, belt was undone because it wasn't really, according to the conspiracy theorists. They just had to come up with a good cover story. Then send him back out because it's all fine. <laughs> then mysteriously find that it's not all fine and get him to park it somewhere which is going to be VSC territory. And it's like. <sighs> That's a big claim. It does stink. It there's something feels wrong about how all of this went down. Can I take myself over to the tinfoil brigade and say that it was uh, uh, summoned by Red Bull? Uh, I don't think I can go there. And I really hope for the sake of the sport, it wasn't either. But oh God, I hope it wasn't. It uh, did but, just seem really weird. <laughs> going the going back out part is the weirdest part. I mean, yes. like going back out, like do you, in Baku when he went back out with. Um, duct tape on his rear wing and they said don't use drs and they saw one of them where it was halfway open that's racing this was bizarre it's like if they sent him back out um with whatever was wrong but everybody pitted max was still in front and we thought that whole one stop two stop strategy at the end was lost until valtteri says hang on a second here i used to be at mercedes and i'm gonna pull a plug i'm gonna pull something for my buddies if you can do it, four. I can number four. I can do it better. So Valtteri decides his engine is going to completely stop. Which, when they showed the replay, is exactly what happened. He's going down the straight, and all you can hear it just decelerating. Like there's no revs. Pulls over to the right, and now we're going to get a full safety car, which is going to allow a lot to happen. And what was curious, and I'm I'm sure going to screw this up a little, but there's a lot to unpack at this point. A Valtteri pulls over on the right. Yellow flags start to come out. And Carlos is making a move, and he goes, he makes a pass at top speed, DRS open, and he whizzes past Valtteri by a couple feet. A stopped car, he's going 200 some odd miles an hour through, it turns out, a very late released yellow flag, which he barely saw, and then he starts braking after that. That was, in my mind, kind of scary to see an overtake. And again, it was bang, bang. I, like, I don't really put a lot on Carlos on this because he couldn't see him. He pulls out around whomever he's passing, I forget, and passes Valtteri sitting in his car at zero. And to me, that when they show that replay, it made me really nervous just to watch that happen the way that did. And I, again, I don't think I fault Carlos for this. And Valtteri pulled over and the flag came out, but it was just a bang bang situation. And that started off this bizarre safety car situation as a whole, where we'll talk more about it. But who pitted and when they pitted? Because I was shocked. The first thing that happened was Max pitted. And I was shocked by that, to give up track position. Yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a weird one because of where Valter had stopped. It meant the, um, it was on the, the, the pit straight. They had to take the safety car through the pit lane in order to make sure they weren't driving past Valter's car as marshals were trying to recover it. So now you've got this kind of, well, I'm in the pit lane anyway. Um, so I don't know, is it easier to just quickly dive in and get out again? But yeah, Max decides to go for uh, softs. Um, which is now, where are we now? Lewis takes uh, track position of the lead, right? And George George is going to be in there as well. So he's going to be his rear gunner. So George is going to, you think, is going to do a really, really poor slow down restart job while Lewis disappears off into the distance. And we hope George holds uh, Max up as long as possible, if you're a Mercedes fan, uh, to see if Lewis can go and get the win. And that's kind of looked like it was going to be. And I think it was the second time around? This yeah. is where we might mess it up. But second time around, going back through the pit lane again, all of a sudden George comes on the radio. And I, this is where I think radio being given to us is way out of sync with what yeah, actually correct. happens. There's no way George is coming into the pit lane and goes, soft to one, soft now. And they have like, it ready. Yeah. We saw with Ferrari, the, I mean, you have half a lap's notice and they can't even get all <laughs> well, four tyres that's the Ferrari time. problem. <laughs> so George has got to have made that call a little bit earlier than that, I guess. And then he decides to go in and get softs. Um, because it's before they've... They can't have all bunched behind the safety car at this point, right? We haven't. Got they were full starting bunch. to. They were starting to, but George wouldn't have been able to go in and get back out and pretty he, much maintain track correct. if they'd fully bunched, right? So I think. But he took you that- saw cars pitting behind him coming out into traffic, <sighs> and so yeah. I think Max actually pitted before the safety car started when cars were still going around Valtteri. So he came in proper, and then when they did the safety car, and then they took him through the pits. That's when George did it for sure, and. Uh, here's so here's my thing i we have no idea when george requested this pit stop but it sounded to the radio like george said i want to go to softs and to me it was a situation where toto should have been on the radio and had a plan he should have been like george 
Because what they did at this point, there was a debate between track position and sort of team approach versus, you know, best tires. And for George himself, of course, the soft tires at this point are the, it turned out to be the right call. And it seemed like most teams figured that out immediately. That's why Max pitted. They said, your tires are done. There's only 10 laps left or whatever it was, 12 laps. Time to go to softs. And so they gave up. This is what's critical. Red Bull made the call to give up first, give up track position for soft tires. And I thought that was silly at first because I didn't appreciate how important the soft tires would be. But then other teams started figuring this out. And when George requested it, Toto was interviewed after the race and gave a sort of wishy-washy answer. You're either playing the team game and going for the win, which Toto said they were doing, but they weren't because, they, as you said, they took the rear gunner from him, let George go to softs, fell behind Max into third. And now Lewis, again, like Crofty mentioned it, I was having flashbacks to Abu Dhabi. You got Lewis on used harder tires, I'll say, because these weren't hards, these were mediums. And now you have Max right behind him on fresh softs. There's no chance Lewis holds him off. He's done before the thing has started. And if George was there, maybe it's a little different. If they pitted both drivers, maybe it's a race. But by pitting George and not Lewis, they left Lewis out to dry. And he got eaten up by everybody. So, so yeah. And then and then here's where I'm going to throw a different thing in. So, I'm, I'm with you. And this is exactly how I was feeling as the race was going on. But kind of in the hours that have gone on since and kind of taking a look at it, I'm thinking, did they just miss a trick on not getting Lewis onto new ones, but then at that point thought, well, where if we put George onto the soft tires, do we guarantee second and fourth, or maybe third if, if Lewis could have held on? Do we guarantee team points now rather than individual win for Lewis, which is what Lewis wanted, right? So did it work out points-wise better for Mercedes the way it played out? Because if they'd have set, kept both of them out on those uh, other tires and tried to make George be the, the, the gunner, um, but but Max goes, and then we see the other soft boys come through and start gobbling them up as well. Do we just see Mercedes dropping down and they, they're they playing that game of, uh, we've only got time to pick one of them. If we put George onto softs because Lewis is already coming through or we haven't made the call or what have you, then team-wise, we're going to end up with more points than if we tried to secure a win for Lewis. I guess that's a good point, I guess. But in my mind, the worst they would have finished would have been third and fourth. And now they finished second and fourth. Second and fourth. So but they would have had a chance for the win had they I gone for they it. Would. And I who don't. knows? Maybe they hold off Charles and maybe they finish second and third. I mean, there's... Yeah. I get it. I just felt it felt muddled. For a team that has professional strategists and are really pretty good and we don't really bag on Mercedes strategy, it felt weird that they would take George away but not pit Lewis too. Either you're all in or you're all out. Is the way yeah, but say. because of where they were and because of the restart and they were coming through the pit lane, right? They're not going to be able... Mm, well, but they I had many laps under and... safety car without being in the pit lane. They could have made this decision. No, but what I mean is you wouldn't... Under the safety car, you're not going to be able to... When they when they suddenly needed to react... I don't understand why they picked uh, George over Lewis potentially, but they wouldn't have been able to double stack. They, they wouldn't have been able to do both of them, right? They didn't have that luxury is what I think. Uh, I think they could have. There were many laps. You could have pitted one and then the other a second lap even. Yeah, yeah, I maybe. don't know. Maybe it, it yeah. is a weird one. It is. It a was weird. weird. One, but I don't. I don't think it's at Ferrari levels of strategy. No, <laughs> not even close. This was a decision, not a mistake. This was. That's fine in my mind. And then um, I don't. I, I don't really know what he did wrong, but he berated himself. Uh, and we got the bleep machine out for Lewis's radio on the restart that he said he screwed that up. I don't. Yeah, think I think, I think, think he kind of bomb that he dropped. He back, but, tried to back him up, and then Max got on the gas. Max actually passed Lewis just after the start finish line, which is the first you can do it. Couldn't have taken him any sooner. Um, yeah. So he really, he really had him. But hold on, we missed something here. Carlos had an, another unsafe release in the pits during that VS during the safety car through the pits thing. It was bad, and we actually have done this before because if you remember, this happened earlier in the season. Paul kind of gave us an explanation that says when all the, the green lights happen on the wheel guns, then there's someone who watches, and along the pit lane there are markings, and you have a window, and if no one's in that window, you hit the button, green, you go. And if someone's in that window, you do not hit the button to release the car. And they released Ferrari. Someone hit the button, released the car into traffic, into Fernando. And it was bad. And uh, watching that happen again, that's the second time that's happened to Carlos this year, where someone gave him the green light and he goes out there and there's people behind him. Yeah. So anyway, sorry. No, that's fine. So And they, and they got a uh, uh, five-second penalty for that in the end, right? So Yeah, which cost him a bunch of spots. Time. It dropped yeah. him to eighth. Because... 
we had what looked like it was going to be a, a battle. Norris got racy with Alonso, got within DRS, and uh, had a couple of nibbles at him. But then it just seemed to fall away. It's like he had one shot uh, on Alonso, and then it kind of fell away. I don't know whether he decided to settle for that. I don't even know if they came over Team Radio and said, look, Carl Sainz has got a penalty, so don't risk tripping over Alonso trying to get past him. You're, you're going to gain a pace anyway, because there's no way Sainz was going to drop these guys by five seconds. There's just not enough laps left to uh, to be able to do that, so who knows? Yeah, and Ocon almost had Sainz in terms of timing. It was only like two-tenths away from catching him, to, but Carlos was eighth. Um, yeah, and as we said already, you know, Max powered off, Charles passed Lewis as well, George and Charles passed Lewis, dropping him to fourth. Um, I don't know. It, I, for a race that, how do I phrase this? I didn't feel like the on-track, naturally occurring action was fantastic. A lot of close following, not a lot of overtaking. Yeah. But the drama of the tires, the pit stops, the VSC, the S, the safety car, and then what that created on track was fun to watch. Yes, I would say it was an exciting race, even if the racing wasn't always that exciting. It, it, and, that, and that's great. You know, do you know what? If if other elements of a of a race weekend can make the the race unpredictable and exciting, I'm all for that. Yes, I love to see cars trying to go past each other, but um, I'd rather have this than kind of one of those just boring. Nothing happens in terms of strategy or racing. So no, I'm with you. It didn't ever hit any kind of high highlights for overtakes. Um, but no, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. Let's hear from Pit Lane Paul and what he had to say. Oh, guys. So I sort of pre-write these um, messages just because, in all in all fairness, uh, if I spoke from the heart right now, it could be quite emotional. So, I mean, we'll start as the sandwich and a triple header. Um, that's Holland as the filling, obviously, just to make sure that one's covered off. It's 297 kilometers from Spa. In Belgium, and more importantly, a, a full uh, 1,010 kilometers from Paul Ricard. So we're all grateful of that one. So Belgium is known for its windmills. They've amazingly over 1,000 of them. And with this race topping out an impressive attendance of about 100,000, uh, each windmill could hold oh, 100 diehard race fans. And the race fans here for something special. The atmosphere is, is, is incredible. I mean, just the noise, the passion, the orange they bring to the circuit. It's a huge party. It, it's it's honestly up there with the best races. And to think that we may have to choose between Spa and Zandvoort and leave races like Saudi Arabia and Bahrain on the calendar is just crazy, you know. Greatest respects to both Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. Like, you know, they have camel sand, more sand than the occasional missile. They simply don't have Heineken and a coffee shop serving, you know, exotic cakes, apparently. Uh, practice on Friday saw local favourite Max hit some trouble, but then he hit back with the, the pace you'd expect. Mercedes looked competitive on a track that sort of suited them. That sort of rolled on to qualifying, where actually if it wasn't for Perez, then Lewis probably would have been on pole. You know, There are a lot of people who belittle Toto saying that in an interview. Um, so let me try and explain how this works. Each driver will have like a delta on a steering wheel, which is a, like it's a complex system of numbers and elves performing database stuff behind the scenes and what this does it actually calculates the time based on a whole lap to where they are on the lap so whereas max was actually up on the splits lewis was predicted to, to perform better over the whole lap and the point that he was up sort of and he would have been quicker max towards the end of the lap so that's how they sort of knew that he was up so yeah don't always look at the split times there's a lot more there's a lot more science behind that so lewis probably would have been pole position, to be fair. It's irrelevant. He didn't. He started fourth. Uh, the race started well. Uh, when I say well, there are no big accidents. The only major accident involved uh, the red team again. Um, Dutch people eat an average of 14.3 kilos of cheese a year. And that must be <laughs> the thing of, uh, of absolute nightmares. And that's what the Ferrari pit wall had yet again. From doing many pit stops, the late call is always a huge nightmare. Like I, as like what we call as a tire collector. Um, I think on a future episode, I could probably go through pit stops a little bit, a little bit more, so you understand how they work. But you, you literally don't have time to react from the time that they say the car's coming in, and the time it takes you to a get the the tire, a get the blanket off, and then b get out there. So the the tire being late is the worst situation. You can't run across the front of the car. That's boxing, needless to say. Uh, you can't run across the back of the car. So you, you literally, the left rear in the circuit we're at was the, the longest tire to get to the car. Um, 
no way is it a blame for the mechanics. It, it seems to be a pit wall issue. Um, that happens. Oh, look, it shouldn't, and it seems to always happen to Ferrari. <laughs> the race then was okay. DRS made a good amount of overtakes at the end of the main straight. Mercedes had a great strategy, which was then changed significantly with Sonoda causing a VSC, um, which was quite a strange incident. Um, and then obviously, you know, we had then the issue with, with Valtteri. Um, claim loss of engine, we don't know yet, but, you know, whatever. It, it's one of those things. It's another safety car. And then, of course, cue another Ferrari issue in the pit lane. Um, <laughs> bless them. Uh, the restart from Lewis was poor, but that was down to the strategy he was on. Um, it was a little like Abu Dhabi, but different. Uh, yeah. Soft tyres were a way to go. Um, but they threw away a great chance of victory today. Um, so you can understand the frustration from Lewis. It, it, you never know how the race finishes, but that's ultimately where we are. Um, George took Lewis. Did the best he can to hunt Max down, but he was, you know, he was pretty much in a world of his own. Max again today. Um, it's very unusual to see Mercedes make mistakes if they, if it was a mistake. Um, it did make the last ten laps exciting, though. Know, it was a good end to the race. Uh, Max did deserve it over the weekend. Mercedes will kick themselves, but they they should be happy with the improvement. You know, it, it was a big step forward for them. Whether that goes to further races, we don't know. Um, Ferrari just keeping, you know, keeep themselves ahead in the comedy stakes. Alpine went well. Lando continues to, to go well and the rest well. There we go. So Zandvoort is a closed area to cars. Uh, the sheer amount of bikes here is insane. It's actually a challenge driving, to be honest, especially as like Holland has a crazy 37,000 kilometers of cycle lanes. Um, and shortly we head to the airport. We hope it to be smooth. Um, we're home for a few days before we head to Monza next week. Sadly, closer to Ricard. But it's the last European <laughs> round of the season, which is crazy. But the fun races do actually start after that. And to end, speaking of fun, let's talk carrots. And this will start any conversation <laughs> in any bar, and it might even get you sent to a special home. Back in the 10th century, carrots were originally white, purple, or pale yellow. So when William of Orange, true name, helped Holland win independence from Spain in the 17th century, the Dutch farmers honoured the king by turning their carrots orange through clever breeding. There we go. Speak to you next week in Monza. What? Carrots. <laughs> what is carrots. that? I, I have not heard that one yet. Um, I did not know about the carrots. I don't even want to talk about the race anymore. They made no. the carrots orange to honour the House of Orange. I mean, like we said Whatever before, this is called. content you cannot get anywhere else. Um, I mean, that is brilliant. And I may be doing a Google search to do my own fact check on that. It's so amazing you and outrageous. You can't fact check, Paul. You have to take his word as gospel. If he says that the farmers made carrots orange to celebrate independence for, for Holland, then that's what happened. And as a, a Dutchie myself, I should know this already, but I don't. There were a couple stats from the race that I thought were fascinating as we close it. Uh, beyond Paul's recap, just a few things here, and we will use this jingle. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, all right, so the Dutch GP. Max has won four, and I'm, by the way, credit to Sean Kelly at Formula One. I borrowed some statistics this week. Um, he, Max has won four consecutive races for the first time in his career, which is a little hard to believe because he's so good and has dominated so much this year. You would have thought either this year or prior he'd done four. He's the first driver to do that uh, other than Lewis since Nico in 2015-16, and Nico had seven in a row. Um, by the way, when Nico was interviewed post-race, I agreed with every single thing he said. I had to go to the bathroom and wash out my eyes. Um, today was Verstappen's 10th win of the year with seven races remaining. And that 10th win matches his 2021 total. And he could still potentially beat Seb and Shumi's record of 13 in a season, uh, which is unbelievable to me that Max is within shouting distance of the most wins ever. And I got to be honest, I'm thinking about mega driving him at Monza. Like, I feel like they're going to have that much of an advantage. But anyway, George's P2 tied his career best. If you want to actually consider the Spa 2021 race a race. Nope. Um, it was Mercedes 12th podium finish of the year without a win, which is pretty amazing. George has moved ahead of Carlos into fourth in the driver's championship and is only 13 points away from second place Charles. Again, without a win. Um, but passing Hamilton late in the race put Charles back into second in the Drivers' Championship, tied with Checo on 201 points. 
And other than the little situation where he went in on Fernando at Spa on lap one, Hamilton, this is amazing, hasn't finished lower than fourth since Monaco. What? They're definitely on an upwards trend. I mean, I, it <laughs> didn't happen today. I think Mons is going to be a bridge too far for them. I don't think their speed is good enough. But right, um, yeah, like Paul said on his on his note, it's you know they'll be upset they didn't win today. But the fact that they're even having that conversation of oh, aren't we so upset we didn't win is not a conversation they thought they would be having right at the beginning of the season. So they should have bought Nui's definitely... book. If they'd bought Nui's book, the car would have been better <laughs> from the beginning of the season. Fernando's was P6 for Alpine. It was his tenth consecutive points finish. But here's where it gets interesting. Esteban was P9. Both Alpines scored for the fifth race in a row. That is shocking to me that five races in a row, both cars have been in the points. That's great. That is, uh, you know, if you'd go back a while, I don't think people would have predicted that at the beginning of the year. And then probably my favorite weirdo stat, Lando Norris, seventh on the grid, finished seventh in the race, is seventh in the driver's championship, and has finished seventh in four of the last five races. Oh, not four of the last seven races. I know, or seven of the last seven would have been better. <laughs> Just let it down at it. the end there, that's I know, so close. And then the last thing from the race. Uh, Lance Stroll, we joked about the Aston Martin and how bad it's been, and maybe this track suited them. Uh, actually, kudos to Lance. He finished 10th. It's his fifth 10th place finish of the year, but he's never finished higher than 10th. So Lance loves to get that last point. Yep. And uh, make sure he takes it from anybody else. So kudos to Lance. And those are the stats of the Dutch GP. <laughs> nice. Um, I haven't checked online to see if the fantasy is updated. Have you taken a look, Brian? Uh, I have not. Uh, maybe been... we'll roll and do a double whammy next week and do a yeah, double I think shout that'd be out. Smart. For, uh, we might be a little close because we're recording it quite soon after the race has ended. Um, and what we've also do already recorded and got in the bag was talking of uh, fantasy um we had the pleasure of catching up with dagan uh who is a guy who is launching a new spin on uh, kind of kind of fantasy kind of like formula one stock market but rather than me blabber on about it let's uh let's hear dagan tell us all about it as we kind of caught up with him for our 100 seconds of drs we are really lucky to have a 100 Seconds of DRS guest with us this week, Dagan. Dagan is from Chicago, as am I. And so our love of Formula One has brought us together as buddies here uh, in the Chicagoland area over Zoom. So, Dagan, welcome to the podcast, man. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel like the lucky one here uh, getting a chance to talk with you guys. No, 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 no. So question for you, man. We were talking a little bit about this before. And we've talked online on Twitter and other things, but tell us a little bit how you got into Formula One because it's a pretty cool story. Uh, yeah, so so I was actually born in South Africa, even though I live uh, in America now. And um, you know, Formula One is is relatively big down there. Um, and so uh, you know, I, I remember Sunday afternoons, everyone would come over, uh, family and you know, and friends and stuff, and we, we'd all watch the race. Um, and you know, my dad was, uh, my, my dad's group me was in England for a while. Uh, you know, he had some memories of that. And so, um, uh, it, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't my favorite sport. Rugby and cricket kind of dominate down there. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, again, I, I had a lot of fun memories of, of kind of Sunday afternoons, you know, just ra races on Sunday afternoons. And obviously that's changed now being in America. You know, a lot of the races are pretty early on, on Sundays. <laughs> um, so yep. I'm either, I'm, I'm either watching them on replay or I'm, I'm getting up early, uh, you know, to, to watch those races. No, oh, that's super cool. And I know exactly what you mean, kind of trading in the whole Sunday afternoon thing for the for the Sunday morning thing. Sunday morning, yeah. Um, I am kind of living by the whole mantra that it's 5 p.m. somewhere, and I have had a couple of pints on a Sunday morning down the local bar watching the races. <laughs> but I think that's Rob a habit I'm going to have to get out of because it's not going to be healthy for me. <laughs> right, yeah. Watching the races is the part Rob adds. He'd be having the pints anyway <laughs> on Sunday at 8 a.m., but he's like, ah, oh, watching the races. Um Dagan, I have a question for you. One thing that you and I have interacted with over uh, on Twitter is really about fantasy. And in particular, you've gotten into um, something that I know Rob and I are pretty interested in, sort of a, a formula market. And so could you kind of explain for everyone what you're working to build um, and kind of the passion you have behind it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, like... Like most Americans, I, I am uh, big into fantasy football. 
Um, yes. First, first started doing fantasy football, you know, probably ten years ago or something like that, and I just like went full into it. Um, and and back then, you know, like the, the idea of dynasty dynasty leagues where you, you're having a, a year over year um, team was was not that wasn't that big. It was sort of like for hardcore uh, players only. Um, but I, I was like really interested in that idea, and I and I started thinking, you know, what maybe I could maybe I could build my own fantasy platform um, that that allowed you to uh, kind of expand on the idea of of you know you pick players and then you. Every every game or so, you, you go against other people and try to try to beat them. Um, and so I pretty pretty quickly fantasy football grew, and I realized that you know this is just a giant market. I'm not whatever. I'm a small small fish in a in the ocean. Um, and so I started thinking, you know, what what sports are you know what are what are some other sports that are that are that are big that don't have as much of a fantasy foundation built? Um, you know, I started thinking about um, soccer and um, and then Formula One. And uh, this was, you know, this was probably five or so years ago. Um, and coincidentally, Drive to Survive had just, you know, come on Netflix. And I hadn't really been into Formula One as much. Uh, and it, it just, Drive to Survive pulled me back in. Um, and I started doing the, you know, the fantasy um, uh, Formula One on the app. And uh, that, you know, that experience, it's not great i mean i'm <laughs> you can uh, we could I, be I honest you can be honest it I, sucks it's horrible <laughs> okay you guys can see it i'm not i don't <laughs> want to <laughs> um but so you know again i started thinking well this you know maybe i could maybe i could build something that would uh just have a, a kind of a different take on on the the weekly experience even the daily experience of uh you know trading trading um different races and and kind of thinking about how how the driver market can actually be, um, how, how, you know, a user can say, I, I want to invest in shares of, uh, you know, Lando Norris. Uh, and then, you know, some, maybe someone else is more about investing in a driver that's getting, that has less of a long-term outlook. You know, maybe, maybe you want to buy shares of Fernando Alonso, even though he's, he's one of the older guys, he, you know, he delivers points and whatever pretty consistently so uh i just kind of started uh, working on something and we've got the beta platform now um you know up uh and so you know as you guys know you you can go on there and, and try it out and right now we're doing some testing making sure that it's it's um you know solid and working on some of the things i, I had one of the users the other day uh you know simulated kind of a bot attack uh because that's that's something that's come up on the um on the, the the main app is like manipulating prices of, of mm. drivers and so you know worked on that a little bit to get that that fixed so uh that's that's the place we're in right now is is this uh and obviously we're in we're in the middle of the season ideally i'd like to you know do a proper launch maybe at the beginning of next year um but uh have you know we'd love to have as many people on there helping us uh you know kind of build out yeah this i i I kind of, I will admit I haven't played with it as much as I probably should have done, but I've dabbled in there just purely because I wanted to try to see if I can beat Brian once I realized that Brian was on there. Um, (laughs) The thing that kind of hit me straight away is that, um, and and maybe you do need to get this thing stood up and then sell the algorithm to the actual F1 fantasy guys, because... um, Whereas the F1 fantasy at the moment seems really prone to those, like those, like you say, that kind of pump and dump bot attacks, those kind of things to yeah. inflate price so that by the end of the season, everybody's going to be able to afford the best guys if they've kind of followed the pattern. But their actual price fluctuation to what's happening on track is almost non-existent because me and Brian have yeah. talked about this on the pod. Lewis Hamilton did nothing for the first six, seven races, yet he was still the most expensive driver pretty much in the game. Whereas yours sure. seems to be a lot more like the stock market, right? If actual on-track performance is going to have just as much impact on the driver's prices as they say people buying and selling and potential bot stuff. So I was really interested to see and ask you without you giving away your secret source, how much Mm -hmm. are you factoring in? What's going into the, to the, the, the the kind of the price mechanics? Yeah. So, um, the, uh, the biggest driver of price right now is, is driver performance on a, on a race weekend. Um, and so, you know, when a driver, finishes in the top 10 he scores race points and those points translate into an, an increase in uh in price um however 20 you know the, the platform is open 24 7 so the the trading dynamics of of users um is constantly affecting the price um you know we we had uh the obviously with oscar piastri 
when the rumors started flying, um, you know, I'm, I'm obviously watching. I, I, I'm able to see all of the back end stuff and, um, you know, albeit small in terms of uh, the number of people actually using it right now. You saw, you know, a handful of people went out and grabbed a bunch of Oscar or Piastri stock um, you know, or, or shares. And you, you saw Piastri moving up the, uh, the market share table. Um, and, and the dude's never, you know, he's never driven. Um, and so that's one of the cool, you know, I, I was, I was looking to, and you look across other platforms, you know, you, you Oscar Piastri is not on there, you know, the, right. this, this platform, you can go in and, and you can go buy shares of Oscar Piastri, um, or Alex Albon, you know, from a, uh, from a price per return basis, this last weekend, Alex Albon had, had the best return per, uh, of any driver because his price based on the points he scored versus the price that you had to buy him at, um, he actually gave you a pretty good return. Uh, you know, most people are going to want to buy the steady guys, the, you know, the, the top five guys or whatever. But when you think about it, those guys are the price, the return based on their prices is, is not going to be as um, uh, solid as maybe if you take a risk on some of these other guys, or if you, maybe you, maybe you invest in one of these younger drivers and they turn out to be, you know, the next, the next Charles Leclerc or whatever. And, um, or, or even Max. I mean, again, if you go back to when Max, is, Max first started driving, um, or even Charles, if you were willing to, let's say this platform existed back when Charles was at Alfa Romeo and you were buying shares of, of him, those, that would be, uh, that would have been a good investment. That yeah. would have been and uh, Apple, Apple shares, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, was, exactly. There, was there a particular user of the platform who saw the Piastri thing coming there was one, and took there a was big one, lead? Was there one guy? There was one in did... particular who went, who, uh, you know, went all in. Yeah. Um, I think his username was Sap. Yeah, that guy sounds like so, the wolf of Lakeshore Drive. And uh, right. well, he's not yeah. winning anymore, though, is he? He's like quite far. Well, behind he's there, so. got responsibilities. <laughs> I can't always be trading the portfolio on a daily well, basis. I, I will say, there's a little bit of um, there's been some testing and like like you know some of the obviously this this platform right now some of the fluctuations you'll you'll notice in there are, are a little crazy because you know I'll be in there testing. I'll be I'll be I'll be pumping and dumping someone you know just to work out the bugs and then you know something we just implemented this week now you, you can't actually do that anymore i mean even if you wanted to you wouldn't be able to do that because we kind of put in a, a minimum time frame that you have to hold uh shares mm -hmm. of, a, of a driver so you, know, cool. you, you buy you buy the shares and now you know you can't sell them you can't buy and sell right away and there's also different things you know i've, I've put in there to help kind of regulate all of that and cool make sure it doesn't doesn't uh fall apart so dagan you know the stock market formula one starting a platform all filled with excitement with energy adrenaline and enthusiasm but none can match the 100 seconds of drs test here on the dirty side so sir are you ready to take your collective knowledge and put it to the test yeah let's Let's go for it. <laughs> do it. So I love how confident everybody is when they answer yeah. that question. Like this is going to be some kind of who wants to be a millionaire quiz, but <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, like, yeah. It, it's, it's only the, it's only 100 seconds, so no lifelines. Yeah, no life. And the good news is it's your answers. So if there's no like right or wrong, but uh, right. I mean they'll all be wrong. But that's okay. Here we go. I'm just kidding. I'm joking. Just a joke, my friend. All right, Rob, you're going to run the timer for us. Yep, I got it. Dagan, are you ready, sir? Yeah, let's do it. Rob, okay, count us in, bud. Guys, in then. So, uh, 100 seconds of DRS in three, two, one, go. What's your favorite cheese? Cheddar. Who's the best young driver in F1? Um, I like. Uh, I think. I think uh, for his age, Lando's Lando's up there. Oh, I love Lando. Favorite F1 track. Um, this is kind of cliche, but Monaco is just. Monaco is awesome. Interesting. What's your favorite restaurant? Um, whew. that is a good one. Um, whatever. Let's just go with Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> we all love Chipotle. It's embarrassing. You no, know, it's okay. Here's the hardest one, and this one actually has a right answer: GIF or JIF? Um, so I always used to say GIF, but I believe it's JIF. Oh, now. all right then. Best racing movie of all time. Um, let's see. Uh, I've got kids, so we watch cars a lot. Okay. Uh, 
So then the other question is, what's the worst racing movie of all time? And if you use the one we talked about in the beginning, it would be an acceptable answer. Yeah, Driven, Driven is up there. Um, yeah, I think let's go with Driven. Uh, agreed. Oh, I'll also say, uh, I mean, Talladega Nights is pretty legendary. That's, yeah. Maybe As worst or best? <laughs> both. Best. It could be both. both, actually. But Favorite musician or musical group? Um, geez, probably like Radiohead or maybe Blur. Nice. nice. So I'm assuming I know the answer. Sleep in or up early? You have kids, right? Yeah, I'm up early pretty often. Yeah. yeah. Sleep, sleeping in is like eight, is like eight o'clock. That's and that's time. time. What? I had so yeah. many more to ask Dagan. Well, I know what you did. I know you've got a library of them, but we don't get through all of them I'm with I'm very anybody. slow. I'm sorry, Dagan. I'm, I... I'm kind of long-winded. Too. No, no, no. It was on me. The that was awesome, man. Long... That was awesome, Thanks. man. The, uh, the question I didn't get a chance to ask, and I'm going to go over. This is extra credit. Um, tires, interesting or not? Hey, Rob, you can't make a face, bro. That's the second time I use that word today. I don't understand what's wrong with me. Super, super interesting. Yes. Um, I mean, often, yeah, often, often, you know, uh, is is the reason someone wins or loses or. Uh, yes, but they shouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. One tire. Just everyone gets. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting if everyone got one compound, you know, five sets of one compound every race. I'd love it. I, I've said this. I'd love for them to bring back the strategy of having Q2 tire. Uh, if you're in the top 10, be your race start tire. Um, mm -hmm. But if they're going to make it totally free choice, I think they should get rid of the two compound rule and let Albon finish Australia on one tire this year, which would have been the coolest thing I'd ever seen. But anyway, yeah, exactly. different story. No, yeah. I sure. agree with you. Just, just, just get rid of just... Yeah, you, just get you're rid all of in it. or you're all out. Like tires, you have to use the strategy or not. But anyway, we've gone off the track. Dagan, <laughs> thank you so much for doing this, man. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on and, and great yeah. to meet you and talk to you. And best of luck with Formula Market. And when you're ready to launch and need more people, let us know. We'd be happy to, to put the word out for you. And just a awesome. small thing, Thanks, just sir. before we let you go, that when you do launch this, and it's obviously going to be a great success, and of course, any people that were in there beta testing the thing need like a huge uh, starting set of credits. <laughs> Oh, absolutely! No, that's already that's already in the bylaws. <laughs> and uh, for nice sure, one, yeah. really nice to meet you, Dagan. I didn't realize there was quantitative easing involved in the formula market, but we won't get into <laughs> economics here today. Have a wonderful day, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, you too. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks again, Dagan. Fantastic. And as always, if anyone wants to do the hundred seconds of DRS, please feel free to reach out to us uh, at Twitter. Uh, we're uh, at, at of one dirty side or dirty side of the track at Gmail. Let us know. We'd love to have you. Or join our Discord server. Yes. And, and we have a channel there to sign up for, which is where Dagan actually signed up. All of this can be found at www.dirtysideofthetrack.com. <laughs> so next week, Rob, is Monza. Do you hold Monza as dear as I do or no? I love it. And um, I love Monza because, it, and this is going to sound stupid, but Monza to me is the real life version of what we used to call scale electrics cars back home. I think ah. it's is it slot cars over here. Yeah, electric um, cars, whatever you call and, them. Yeah, yeah. You know, you pretty much, no one builds a track where they want to be like letting go of the throttle and having an intricate little corners where you've got those slot cars. You just want to put the car in its slot and hold that thing back <laughs> and just go flat out all the way around some giant ring that you've made, right? Yeah. And hope that it doesn't end up pirouetting off and disappearing under a couch somewhere and you have to go and crawl and find your car. It gets However, covered in carpet fuzz. You got to exactly, get Exactly. And then having to do that kind of like real MacGyvering of the, the bristles underneath on the brushes to try to get the thing running again. Yeah, Anywho, rub it on your shirt, but yeah. <laughs> Mons is the real life version of that, right? I think it's just an insane... Um, insane circuit and um, I hadn't realized that it's uh, when we were looking for the stats for this so you've got the it's actually the Italian Grand Prix this week now as we know or maybe new listeners don't you'll you'll get um, a Grand Prix which is designated as from a country the Italian Grand Prix the British Grand Prix it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be held at the same track it's just the title of the Italian Grand Prix so the Italian Grand Prix has been around since uh, the 1920s it's the fifth uh, fifth oldest national Grand Prix um, and it's been actually held at Monza every single year since 1950, with one exception when the Italian Grand Prix was at Imola in 1980. So what that's happened in pretty, 80? Uh, they decided they needed a rest. I don't in know. 79, yeah. they like made it, you know, we're going to move it this year. We go to Imola. Now, it used to be huge track, uh, and there was also a high-speed oval kind of embedded in it, and they've had various different changes along the way, but pretty much for a big chunk of time now, we've got a 3.6-mile uh, circuit, 
the old high speed oval barely even plays into it now if you look at a, a an overhead image of it on the internet or google map it or whatever you can still see the oval but really i think it just contributes a part of the um uh, start finish straight line now is uh, on the old part of the oval um and you're essentially on full throttle for the in- so i wasn't joking about the slot cars right there are six corner complexes you've got the two first two chicanes the two lesmos which i always giggle at because i don't think it always yeah. sounds like lesmos we- when they say nope. it um, the scari complex and the parabolica and the I rest of it parabolica. you're basically foot nailed to the floor yeah even parabolica is pretty close to uh is the high speed charles had a nasty crash there a couple years ago when he lost the rear end um it's the temple of speed that's what Monza is. It is amazing. You do not want downforce here. So the cars with the highest top speed, as I already talked about, are going to be favored. I know you didn't like my stat earlier. Oh, no, your stat's going to work here massively. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so interestingly, at this track at Monza, the most wins, there are two drivers of five. Michael Schumacher and Lewis Hamilton. No one has four. There's a bunch, bunch of people with three. Um, but those two have had the most wins at Monza. And there, here I've got a couple things that I actually find sort of interesting. Of the active drivers who have won, one we're talking about, Seb's won three times, Fernando's won twice, and then in the last three years we've had Charles, Pierre, and Daniel Ricciardo uh, with one. And you can actually remember these, right? You remember last year Daniel held off Lando at the end, it was a McLaren 1-2. The year prior Pierre got his maiden win, um, and you remember him crying on the podium with no fans there, and the year before that Charles won at home, the Tafosi went nuts. And he had just, I was thinking his second win after Spa, his first, and he just lost his friend Antoine. So Max has zero wins, but hold on to that for a second. Um, I would say the track is interesting. It doesn't require winning from the pole. Every People up to 11 have won multiple times. No one's ever won from 12 and beyond. So you <laughs> obvious stat of the week, you want a decent qualifying, at least before 12. But here's where it gets, I think, kind of cool. A, my Uncle Pete went to Monza in 2013 and watched the race. And B, in case you don't care about my Uncle Pete going there, um, here's the kicker. Over half the grid, and I did this math myself, over half the grid has a podium at Monza. None of them are max. The current drivers with a podium are Luis, Fernando, Seb, Valtteri, at least one. Most of these people have multiple. But Luis, Fernando, Seb, Valtteri, Checo, Charles, Carlos, Lance, Pierre, Lando, Daniel. That's 11 drivers of the 20 drivers on the grid. Max, Emilian, Verstappen has zero. So I'm that's guessing that's going to change. Week. Yeah, unless he I mean, has bad going luck. Back to your, going back to yeah. your failed attempt at a stat earlier on, where that will come to its fore, that graph that you've, uh, maybe we should put it out on social, but that differential in top speed and that slippiness that they talk about with the design of that Red Bull, that is a rocket ship, and I do not see anybody getting close to it uh, next week. It just, unless it's mechanical failure or um, a mistake, which we really haven't seen many from Max, I don't see how anybody else comes to the party next week. I don't either. Um, I actually, I think Mercedes is in trouble. Oh, yeah. Uh, if, you, if I go back to your, your uh, graph, right, Alpha Tauri, I know it's a different track and, and, it's, yeah, yeah. and it, it's different, right? But um, Alpine no is the one I'm close. looking at. Yeah, Alpine, Alpha Tauri, and Haas have got decent top line speed compared to the Red Bull, but they're not going to. Maybe Alpine. Maybe you're right. I think it's Alpine. Um, I really. I'm not saying they're going to be second, third. Please. I, I think you're going to see Red Bull. You'll see Ferrari competing because their drivers are fantastic. But I think Fernando's going to be sticking his nose up in there with the likes of anybody else. I mean, I'd be shocked if you don't see Fernando finishing top five next week. Yeah, unless if any of them can cut loose, and maybe some of them have struggled with some of the tracks recently that have kind of had a little bit of a. Uh, you need a bit of both, you know, like right. Spa, Sector 1, and Spectre. Uh, Spectre? Sector 1 and Sector 3. <laughs> Inspector Seb? Of, <laughs> Spectre, is that, is that James Bond? Anyway, yeah, Sector 1 I and like Sector 3 one. was like pure out speed, and Sector 2 needed the downforce because of the complex corners. Um, Mons really doesn't need that. I mean, you can essentially just put a thin strip of duct tape as your rear wing, right? right. You, just, you just don't need anything. So Just some you, brakes. You need some brakes for the <laughs> chicanes and that's it. Exactly. So maybe, maybe we see the other cars that have struggled with the balance. If they're just allowed to say, no, have at it, just go as fast as you can, maybe others come back into it. I just, uh, not wanting to kind of look down at this and just say, well, don't bother tuning in next week because it's going to be the Max Verstappen show. I think it's the Max Verstappen show next week and I think he kicks your stats into touch there where he rectifies both podium and wins all in one go. 
I think you may as well. And I am curious, the first turn, last thing I'll say, so you get past the chicane, there's this long, for anyone who's never watched, there's this long sweeping right um, called Curva Grande. And I love it because it's full speed now, but people have, and Lando did this, I think, twice in the last couple of years, try to pass someone on the grass on the inside at full throttle. I mean, I, I'm really hoping we see people with daring moves like that, where they get a couple tires into the grass, try to get around. Uh, Parabolica is, at the end, before you come back to the straight, is just an amazing corner. It's, it's, it seems easy. It's not. It's hard to get right at the right speed. Um, and the Lesmos, uh, that's an M, not a B. And the Lesmos are fun to watch as well because it does require some proficiency. But outside of those, I mean, they're really, there's two other corners I didn't mention. The rest of it is just, as you said, uh, put the cruise control on max for Stappen and let it go. Yeah, but I'm still looking forward to it because it will still give, um, even if Max does disappear into the distance, I'm actually seeing a lot of um, a lot more passing and um, yeah. on race on track racing than we saw today because um, teams will get huge DRS. Uh, advantage down the straights there are although there aren't many corners there are a good decent amount of breaking zones so there is the chance to kind of uh, fly throw a torpedo down the inside so i still love it still love this track i just not really sure we're going to see anybody um max might have quite a lonely race but yeah. who knows that statement yeah. might not age well and we might have uh, a big upset this time next week well i guess you'll have to tune in to find out and i'd like <laughs> yeah, to thank everyone for tuning in this week how was that segue <laughs> that was awesome but i think right now we should probably just uh say goodbye and play the exit music brilliant everyone have a wonderful week talk to you soon